Hi, my name is Katherine Walworth. I'm curator here at the Columbia Museum of Art, and I am beyond excited to welcome you today. We've brought you the best. I'm so excited about Siddhartha Shah, this wonderful voice to give our keynote lecture for this exhibition. Shah is the Peabody Essex Museum's curator of Indian and South Asian art and has recently been appointed director of education and civic engagement. He earned his BA in art history from Johns Hopkins University, an MA in East-West Psychology from the California Institute of Integral Studies, and a PhD in art history from Columbia University. Shaw also serves on the advisory council of the Anne Frank Center for Mutual Respect and on the board of the American Council for Southern Asian Art. I would like to give a special thank you to all the sponsors for Visions from India. We couldn't do what we do without you. And a special thank you to presenting sponsors, Joyce and George Hill. I hope that whether you've already seen the exhibition this weekend or you come back afterwards, please, please come see it in person because each gallery is a completely different and remarkable experience. It's not only smart and powerful, it's fun and it's really interactive. So we hope you'll come down and see it in person. Without further ado, please welcome Siddhartha Shah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Siddharth Shah, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for having me, um, inviting me to speak about this exhibition and about my work. I do very much wish I could be there in person, but I'm calling in from Salem, Massachusetts, where we are in the throes of Halloween festivities. Um, I'm going to share with you a little bit about my work, um, starting kind of way back in history uh, in the 19th century as a way of better understanding how to look at modern and contemporary Indian art. So let's just get started. When the first World's Fair opened at the Crystal Palace in London, the Great Exhibition of 1851, 30,000 square feet were allotted to the display of India alone. The organizers of the India section wanted to portray an image of India that was authentic, a faithful picture. But what they produced was one that privileged and emphasized two extremes, a timeless, fertile, largely untapped wellspring of natural and human resources, and a land of unfathomable decadence and indulgence. Now, this is an ongoing trend to view South Asia as polarized between rich and poor, old and new, urban and village, etc. But what this essentially does is it, it glosses over so much of the spaces in between, um, as well as the ways in which these polarities actually can interact with each other. So I'm just highlighting that because it's um, It'll, it'll come up uh, shortly in, in a little bit and in terms of how to look at the work that's in this exhibition. At the center of the display of India at the Crystal Palace was a giant stuffed elephant. Yes, a taxidermied elephant with Queen Victoria's gold howdah perched on its back. Dressed in colorful fabrics and adorned with flowers hanging from its ears, the flamboyantly festooned elephant mirrored the barbaric pomp of Indian Maharajas, further underscored by the numerous other contributions from India that included precious metals, fabrics, carpets, shawls, ivory, uh, profusion of gold and gems, rubies and diamonds, emeralds and pearls. Visitors to the Crystal Palace referred to the ostentatious lifestyle of Indian kings and described the court as a kind of fairyland, teeming with riches and excess. Words like opulence and fantasy became associated with India, employed at times pejoratively, and in contrast to the far more reserved and in their own eyes more refined tastes of the British. The fabrics and ornaments on view were described by one visitor as, quote, wondrous pieces of barbaric splendor, end quote. While a set of clay figures showing the diversity of Indian people 
evoked in him a different kind of shock and disbelief. They can play, convey the, the flip side of princely India. And I quote here, can these be the people who have woven these magnificent fabrics, who've carved these wondrous ornaments in scented wood, in ivory and in gold? A lean, starved out regiment of squalid beggars, half naked, or with scanty folds of coarsest cotton flung around their wasted limbs. So India was, for all intents and purposes, a land of extreme wealth and extreme poverty. And as a side note, I will add, so was England. And it, India was somehow locked in the past, incapable of progressing into the modern era. The people were viewed as performing the same crafts and using the same methods as their ancestors had thousands of years ago. They were incapable of innovation or invention, incapable of originality, for all they could do is copy from the past and follow orders. So in the British imagination, it was as if India was ripe for the taking and its people somehow placed on earth in order to serve. So in 1857, just six years after the Great Exhibition of 1851, Indian soldiers across the country rose up against their British superiors in a bloody rebellion that led to the slaughter of approximately 6,000 British in India. And at least 800,000 Indians were tortured and killed in retaliation. The mutiny led to the British crown taking full control of India. And it was at this point that the British interest in knowing and understanding India and Indian people became one of far more strict surveillance, classification, and categorization. Western travelers and British officials in India spent tremendous amounts of time and money observing the people, documenting their physical and cultural distinctions their practices and behaviors, classifying them as one might classify insects or bird specimens. Now, as a side note here, um, there, there is a connection between how in, 19, how in the 19th century um, people looked at flora and fauna of India as well as the people. So they saw a connection between Indian people and the kinds of animals that were in India. So the Indian Maharajas, were compared to the Indian peacock, uh, parading, uh, glamorous, kind of showing off and pompous, but also like the peacock can't fly very far because of the weight of its feathers, that Indian kings were somehow so obsessed with glamour that they were incapable of fighting very well and were just inherently weak. The majority of Indian people were like the Indian elephant, um, able to be beaten into submission, uh, and then turned into hard workers. But then there were those like the mutinous soldiers of 1857, the kind of silent threat looming in the background waiting for the ideal moment to strike. And they were compared to the Indian tiger, an animal that needed to be captured, controlled, killed, and if at all possible, completely exterminated. So India has long been a fantasy or a mystery to the West, and Indian people have been perceived as a mystery too. Strange and mystifying, incapable of being understood with their, or should I say, our circular or cyclical notions of time, and with a capacity to hold and contain so many polarities, ambiguities, and multiplicities. But, Somehow, the burden of demystifying the subcontinent and its many cultures falls on us, when it's actually the narrow and flawed lenses through which the region has been viewed for centuries, and that needs to be addressed. So in my work at the Peabody Essex Museum, I have tried to bridge this troublesome period of British occupation with the study of modern India in its post-independence era to connect an earlier history of desperately trying to com comprehend and master the Indian body, particularly that of the artist or artisan, 
with a more recent history of misunderstanding or misreading Indian art or the Indian artist. So I began at the museum about two and a half years ago. And since my arrival, I have been working on a, uh, a reinstallation and a complete reinterpretation of our collections that span mostly from the 18th century to the 21st century. So the new galleries, which are opening in just about a month uh, on Black Friday, November 27th, um, they're separated between one gallery that's focused on the historical material and another that shows our collection of modern Indian art. Now I'll mention here that the Peabody Essex Museum is not only the oldest continually running museum in the United States, um, it traces its origins back to 1799, but it is also the first institution outside of India to focus on the art of its modern painters. And we possess what is arguably one of the largest and most important collections of modern Indian art in the world, the Chester and Davida Hurwitz collection. Now, this is part of what makes the Peabody Essex so fantastic, but it's also part of the challenge. Most museums in the United States with collections of Indian art they, they tend to focus on art of, of an older time. So early Buddhist and Hindu stone sculpture, bronzes, up to Mughal miniatures and, um, and Indian paintings. Um, what this means though, is that the Peabody Essex Museum and the Columbia Museum of Art with their exhibition have more work to do because the material is actually so unfamiliar to many, many people. So this afternoon, I'm sharing with you some of my work at the Peabody Essex Museum because I feel it kind of will set us up for the kind of work that's in this fantastic exhibition, Visions from India, um, that many of you will have an opportunity to see. And hopefully it gives you a pathway in and a sense of what to look for in the art and how to look at it. So at the Peabody Essex Museum, the first South Asian gallery, the one of historical material, opens with a face-off between two powerful women to set the stage and the tone for what follows. Now, one of the strengths of our South Asian department uh, is this phenomenal collection of Kaligat paintings that we have. And here you have two Kaligat paintings. It's a graphic treatment of two paintings in our collection. Named after a temple to the goddess Kali in Bengal, where they were sold in the mid and late 19th century, these rather simple and quickly rendered paintings were originally produced as um, inexpensive devotional objects for Hindu, Hindu pilgrims, um, but before long became quite popular with Western travelers who sought to bring curiosities and conversation pieces with them back home. So at the entrance to the gallery, we have the goddess Kali here on the right. And we have on the left, a woman dressed in a sari and wearing a crown. The painting is rather oddly labeled Queen Victoria. The graphics visualize, I'll just go back here for a sec. The graphics visualize a battle for power between these two women, a British queen, and an Indian goddess who represent to me the tensions between Britain and India itself. And I'd be happy to discuss this dynamic later during a question and answer period if anyone wants to know more about, more about this because I actually um, am, am very, very interested in Victorian India, but that's not the subject of our talk today. So moving into this gallery, the visitors, visitors encounter some of the earliest objects in our collection brought back by Salem merchants who joined their European rivals in a lucrative trade with India in the late 1700s. These objects focus on and reveal a fascination with the people of India. Images of Indian people fed a sincere curiosity to learn about a foreign culture, but in the 19th century, this also fed a hunger to master and control those that were considered racially inferior. The most collected and most collectible portrayals were those that emphasized the difference and the subservience of Indians. Images of laborers, servants uh, waiting on their superiors, as well as uh, the sick, the elderly, and the poor. 
These objects reinforced a common Western belief in a hierarchy of races that placed whiteness at the top of an evolutionary ladder, a belief that deeply influenced generations and continues to shape the ways in which we think of India today. We feature in this gallery pages from an eight volume series entitled The People of India. Published between 1868 and 1875, the series was commissioned by the British government and it subdivided and documented people based on caste, occupation, religion, and geography. Consequently, the publishers transformed the many diverse populations of the Indian subcontinent into cataloged images that were easily consumed, collected, and critiqued by their oppressors. In this gallery, we also feature some of the most fascinating objects, at least in my opinion, at the Peabody Essex Museum, including a selection from our nearly 200 unfired clay figures representing different types. The kind of clay figures that one would have seen at the Crystal Palace in 1851, and that were earlier described as squalid beggars. Depicted with individual accessories, real textile costumes, and human hair, each figure was carefully crafted to present a lifelike picture of an Indian person. Despite their striking realism, the West often received these objects not as works of fine art, but as curiosities intended for ethnographic study and display. I have here a close-up of who is really the star of our historic gallery. This is one of our life-size clay figures who came to Salem in 1823. So he's been a resident here for nearly 200 years. And there are a few particularly fascinating things about him. Um, you see these rectangular markings on his body. Early on when he came, this is a devotee of Krishna. Those had said Radha Krishna, the Hindu god Krishna and his consort Radha in Bengali. But over years of painting, um, those characters are now these indecipherable, just made up forms in these rectangles. Uh, the other thing is, is over the years, he has been painted darker and darker. Yes, he's aged and gotten darker, but it's also he's actually been painted as if his otherness has been emphasized over and over as times progress. And perhaps most disturbing and impressive of all are our selection of nearly 50 paper mache heads. So this is just a few of them uh, that illustrate different turban styles worn by men of various religious and ethnic groups. Modeled with great attention to detail, a number of these heads feature disfigurements like scars caused, uh, caused by smallpox. Similar sets of heads were displayed in the 19th century where Western audiences viewed these facial marks and features as evidence of a debased Indian population ravaged by poverty and disease. A reductive vision of India that in many ways persists today. So I share all this with you as a lead in to discussing modern and contemporary art and to drive home the fact that so many of the ideas that people have of India, um, the things that you hear people saying all the time, there's so many people there, there's so much poverty and sickness, et cetera, et cetera. First of all, these can be said about any number of places on earth, including the United States. But these associations specific to India have persisted for hundreds of years. And it is largely because of these colonial era perceptions that people sometimes have a hard time with Indian art that doesn't perpetuate these tropes. This requires a kind of unlearning of old fantasies and ideas we have of India and an effort to see with new eyes, to read contemporary Indian art, not simply as derivative of Western art. And this would go back to what I mentioned early on, the idea that Indian artists and artisans were incapable of invention or in innovation and all they did was copy. Um, so to view Indian contemporary art as derivative is really to just fall for that trap. Um, but I encourage you to look at contemporary Indian art as something, something very new, something that is potentially simultaneously Indian and global, simultaneously modern, and at times traditional. 
So in contrast to the historical gallery at the museum, which focuses on outsiders' visions of India, the Gallery of Modern Art examines Indians, how Indians viewed themselves for themselves. And, and this is not unlike the Visions from India exhibition. It opens with a defining moment in the history of India as we know it today, independence. The Indian struggle for self-rule gained momentum in the 20th century, largely incited by Mahatma Gandhi's nonviolent protests against the British. When they finally ended their over 300 year occupation of the subcontinent, and this ended in 1947, the British left behind a divided land and a turbulent legacy that persists to this day. As a part of their withdrawal, a British civil servant, Cyril Radcliffe, a man who had never been to the region and knew little about its geography or cultural history, drew an arbitrary line on a map or two lines um, that divided the area into the Islamic dominion of Pakistan, which is today Pakistan and Bangladesh, and the secular nation of India. Partition, as this event came to be called, displaced millions. Unimaginable violence erupted as people of various faiths uprooted their lives in order to be on the right side of the line that had been drawn across their homeland. In both India and Pakistan, artists grappled with the question, what does it mean to be of a country that is both ancient and new? Indian artists turned to their country's long history and unfettered future to create a unique and distinctly Indian visual language. The subcontinent's rich wellspring of epics and tales became a source for some, while others drew inspiration from European and American art. Others traveled and trained outside of India. So whereas modernism is sometimes defined, I've actually seen this um, on a particular museum's website, modernism is viewed as a movement that rejected art of the past. That is not necessarily the case in India, where many artists sought to integrate the past into a vision for the future. So in entering the gallery of modern art, our visitors will be greeted with a quote, one of my favorite quotes from, from Tagore, one of Tagore's poems, Gitanjali 35, let my country awake. And what they see here is um, they encounter a, a visualization or an image of the British presence in India on the left with Hussein's a painting from the Raj series, as well as the traumas of partition on the right that involved both the severing of land and limbs. And I will get into this in a moment, but in case I forget, um, Taya Mehta's painting on the right is from the early 1970s. And this is a moment when this diagonal enters uh, his work. And it has been read by many as a, as a metaphor for partition, where a line cuts across the canvas, often severing bodies. And it's very kind of a jarring and traumatic um, image. And from this introduction, we move swiftly into what is the heart of the Hurwitz collection and certainly the heart of the gallery, a series of paintings by Makbul Fida Hussein on the Mahabharata. The Mahabharata is the longest epic in human history. And in 1971, which is also the year of India's second partition when Bangladesh, Bangladesh becomes an independent nation, um, Hussein was invited to participate in the 11th um, Sao Paulo Biennale. And there were only two artists that were uh, offered exclusive exhibition space. One was Hussein and the other was Pablo Picasso. So Hussein was really um, excited about this opportunity and decided to do a series of paintings, 29 in all, based on this epic. Um, as a kind of homage to Picasso. So you see this painting above um, in black and white. That could be read as kind of being inspired by Picasso's painting, Guernica, which is also in black and white. But the thing with the Mahabharata is that it is, for Hussein, an ideal metaphor for partition. And not just partition of 47 or 71, but about this idea 
of a land or a people split in two because the epic centers on two feuding factions born of the same blood, cousins fighting against each other in an epic battle. So it became an ideal metaphor for the troubles that beset the subcontinent. From there, we look to the process of nation building. Independence was a moment of celebration for sure, but it was also, as I mentioned, a deeply traumatic moment, a very bloody birth of two nations. And millions of refugees flooded to cities in, in search of like establishing their lives, but in a country that itself was trying to, to get established. And so this looks at actually the process of building a new nation and forming a new unified Indian identity. One of the, the visions of Nehru, India's first prime minister, was a unity in diversity. As I mentioned when I started, there is so much diversity in India. Um, diversity of language, of religions, of cultural practices and beliefs. And in 1947, with a new nation, people had to somehow come together. Or that was the goal to bring people together around the vision of a new nation. But of course, the diversity of India is part of what makes it so unique, but it is also perhaps the biggest challenge to this dream of a, of a peaceful, secular, and democratic nation. And so we have a section that looks at the conflicts and consequences of partition. So there was, there was the split between India and the dominions of Pakistan in 1947. There was another partition in 1971. Um, violence and trauma in the 80s during the time of Indira Gandhi's um, rule. And in 1992, another series of communal riots and attacks, which inspired the painting on the left by Nalini Malani and Vivan Sundaram's work on the right that is a kind of homage to an anonymous corpse that was um, of a man who was killed in Bombay following some riots. Whereas the painting in the center by Ram Kumar is from the 1950s. And I'll just share a kind of a personal story about this. Um, when I saw this painting, I immediately remembered a photograph of my father that he had shared with me a long time ago. And it was um, of him and some of his classmates, all men wearing ties, um, before my father came to the United States in the late 60s. And as he was showing me this photo, um, he explained that several of the men in the photo had left India and moved to other countries. Now this painting by Ram Kumar is actually called Unemployed Graduates. And it's from 1956 and it's looking at how you had all of these very, very educated people in India, but when the British left, there was a real um, struggle to get employment and it kind of led to why so many Indians had to leave their country. And so in looking at this, um, this painting, you can see the, the suffering, the fear and the anxiety that comes with being in a, in a country that hasn't really found its place yet. Um, this is a very, very challenging and difficult portion of the gallery. We then move into a section on abstraction. Now, I have also seen in many places this idea that abstraction emerges in the West, that it's kind of a Western development. Um, I think there's any number of, of scholars of South Asian art who could fairly easily um, debate that. And so what we have here is artists who are pulling from a lot of earlier Hindu, Buddhist, um, Islamic um, philosophies and um, sacred geometry to have a vision of spirituality that is more um, universal. So while there have been uh, many people in India who have emphasized the differences between different faiths, um, there are others who've really tried to like to have a a, a, an identity coalesce around a universal spirituality. And so I look here at abstraction um, as one of the expressions of that, of that dream of a universal, peaceful, humane society. Um, and uh, we have you know, the painting by Raza is, is one of our many masterpieces by him. Um, Santosh, here we have an exercise for our, our visitors between two paintings by him to really look at how um, 
how we can learn to read abstract art because it's quite intimidating to a lot of people. And then Buren Day's image, which reads almost like a solar eclipse to me, but also as if this like mound of earth is rising up to greet the sun. Another section looks at women revolutionaries, women as artists and as subjects. Now, the women and the female body are essential to classical Indian art. They appear as ornament all over temples and early Buddhist stupas. Um, they often appear as goddesses, um, mothers, consorts. But in modern India, we have this um, women as not peripheral figures, but as central to images who have lives and experiences of their own. And so we pay homage here to women artists like Nalini Malani and Rekha Rudwitiya, who pull from their own experiences um, of joy, of sorrow, of sexual freedom and liberation, and a painting by Emma Hussein on the right of, of Pulandevi, the bandit queen, um, which I can also touch on later, but a woman who really redefined what it meant to be a woman in modern India. And we follow with a section on India and the world. Indian art has not developed in a vacuum. Um, Indian art is as much about India as it is about the rest of the world. So this section looks at um, Indian artists who traveled abroad, um, who found inspiration from artists of different countries. And so here on the left, you see this painting by Atul Doria, whose partner Anju Doria has a painting in the exhibition at the Columbia Museum of Art. And you see it's based actually on a Bollywood film poster um, for the film Bazigar, where the actor Shah Rukh Khan is wearing um, sunglasses and then he's got an image of these two actresses um, reflected kind of in, in the glasses. But here Atul Doria has actually um, placed two of his kind of um, most most inspiring artists. Uh, Bhupen Kakkar on the right, whose painting you see um, in the lower register here in the center, and David Hockney in the left. So our collection, in a, and that's a, a quick overview of this very large gallery um, at the Peabody Essex Museum. Our collection essentially ends in the late 1990s. And as such, it is, it is dated. And I don't see that as a problem. It just really engages a particularly charged moment in the history of modern India, which is from partition 1947 to the 90s. And what's kind of exciting is that it's as if the um, Visions from India exhibition then goes um, a step after this. And so to, to, to bring the Herbert's collection into conversation with the kind of works that are exhibited um, in this show um, is a great opportunity for us to see where there are connections and continuities between the works that were produced earlier and where we see um, more drastic and dramatic changes. Because the art has continued to progress. Um, and I will show you perhaps just a few objects from this show um, where you can see some connections with what I've talked about. Um, reflections on violence and reflections on the human body. Um, while there is abstract work in modern Indian art, I would say the vast majority does tend to be figurative or somehow engage the human body or the human form. So Rina Kalat xylophone one here, you can see it's like lungs and a rib cage made of weapons. And she also regularly mines her memories, both personal, I would say, as well as ancestral. Um, and, and it's constantly questioning in her works why we do the things we do why um, violence or kind of what the role of violence is in um, our lived experiences and perhaps even in national identity. Sudha Shanshetti is a trained painter and you see this a lot in India where artists work across many, many different mediums, um, not really feeling restricted by just one. And so he's a trained uh, painter, but it's really his um, installations that are that are most memorable to me, where he brings all kinds of objects and mediums together and uh, moving parts, mechanical pieces, um, but they also can feel quite ominous um, and foreboding. So this, for example, is in the show, um, A Visions from India, and the sword that you see swings like a pendulum. 
And so it reads almost like a metronome or a ticking, a ticking clock, but also this, this uh, violent device that could injure or kill. Anju Dodia, the wife of Atul Dodia, regularly paints about uh, the artist's experience and process and plight. And I'm a huge fan of her work, and I'm so bummed that we don't have any of her work yet in our collection. And I'm thrilled that you get to have this piece in your show, um, where the artist um, implement the pencil is suspended from the crown, a symbol of like pride and ego, um, pointed towards the eye of the artist. And she does, I would love to speak to her someday about her use of sharp objects and of the implements of the artist as weapons. And another thing I'll notice here is um, we regularly have lots of work by women artists. And I think that this show um, at the Columbia Museum of Art does a fantastic job of showing work by women artists. Um, so we also have in that show work by Bharti Kerr. Bharti Kerr is a really fascinating artist for a number of reasons. Um, I mentioned early on that sometimes when people confront Indian art, if it's not like a sorry clad woman or a man in a turban or something that connects to some trope uh, that we have in our minds, uh, people don't often know what to do. And what's, what's interesting about Bharti is that she was born in the UK and then moved to India in the 90s, I think. And her work does not read as Indian at all. Um, whereas if you look at Sudarshan Shetty's work, you see that it's like carved wood, it kind of reads as a very Indic. Bharti's work does not say that at all. And yet what she uses are bindis, or in this case, these little arrows, bindis, which would be the stickers that, that typically women wear on their foreheads. So a distinctly Indian marker, a distinct marker of Indian identity becomes the thing which she uses um, to create works that do not read as Indian at all in this case. And then, of course, there's um, Kanishka Raja, the late Kanishka Raja, who passed away recently, um, who was based in New York. And um, I am such a fan of his work. And to me, they convey a, a state or spaces of suspension, a kind of purgatory or some place in between, like a no man's land. Now, no man's land obviously relates to borders. Um, when you think about the border between India and Pakistan, there is a no man's land there with all kinds of cameras there, um, constantly pointing in the direction of the no man's land. Um, so to think that Kanishka, I don't know what his direct experience with partition was or if his family was directly um, affected by it. And this is not necessarily a reference to partition per se, but you see the schism, the split, a divide like Tayameta's diagonal. This is something that appears in a lot of um, modern and contemporary work from South Asia. And just to close here, I'm going to put it in comparison with this painting by Emma Hussein from the Mahabharata series, which shows the figure of Bhishma. Bhishma is kind of the grand sire of the Mahabharata. He is like a great uncle who is the uncle of both of the feuding factions. And while in his heart he is aligned with, with the Pandavas, who are kind of the good guys, he needs to fight on the side of the Kauravas, the bad guys. Um, and in his final moments, he's shot full of all of these arrows and he lies on a bed of arrows for over 50 days, um, offering teachings before he finally passes. And Hussein shows Bhishma here in a moment of suspension, caught between life and death, day and night, um, darkness and light, because he actually dies just after the winter solstice, when the power of the sun and the power of light is finally able to overtake the power of darkness. And so just to think about the persistence we have of suspension, discomfort, and split identities as, as something that appears regularly. And I, I just encourage you to view some of the works in this exhibition through that lens and some of the other things that I have shared. So I'm going to stop there and um, open it up to conversation and questions. Maybe Catherine has some things she'd like to talk about with me.
I have a lot of things I want to talk about. <laughs> and, and I'm going to cheat a little bit because you and I have talked a little bit uh, on the side. And I, I want to bring people into those conversations. And, and one is an issue that you brought up. And I think that this painting at the end and the other painting by Kanishka Raja in the show uh, really get to, which is the, the idea of partition, that moment in 1947 when you know the boundary lines are driven drawn and and as you said most of the artists in this exhibition were not born at that time so that is something that we talk about now sort of inherited trauma almost yeah. in the dna it's something that gets brought up now in a way that wasn't um 15 20 years ago when i was looking at german art by artists for example wondering well you weren't born yet what's that i'm just really interested in the way that art and artists um, deal with that so yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think, so on one hand, I have felt that when, I almost feel like it, it can get a bit lazy to constantly curate or view modern and contemporary Indian art through the lens of partition. I mean, it was our never forget moment. Millions of people died. There is no, we must not like under, estimate or like, you know, um, it was hugely traumatic. Um, but it's also connected to the birth of this country. So, so like Indian identity will always be tied to partition because that's when a new India is born. Um, so I think that like I was not born during partition. My, my father was, my mother was born in 48. But the thing is, is it's like, you know, you don't, you don't have to have experienced the Holocaust as a Jewish person to understand that trauma and for that to live in your body and for you to have feelings around that. And I think that there's a lot of that in the South Asian diaspora and people in South Asia itself as well. Like They might not have lived it, but the reverberations, the ramifications of that trauma are still very, very much alive. And the thing I'll say with Kanishka and other artists who were um, from India, who then moved abroad, is that if you take partition, which is about a split, and then like me, I'm born and raised in the United States, but I'm still really Indian, my own identity is split and severed. So, so I don't necessarily relate to partition, but I still am able to read paintings that are about partition because I can identify with some sense of that broken circle or a split um, that, that often shows up in this work. You bring up a good point there, and it's been something that I, it seems like I can say three different sentences in one sentence about identity in this exhibition and try and explain, uh, you know, they all happen to be artists with deep, deep ties to India. Most of them live in India, grew up in India, but yet they're also just some of the best artists working in the world today. They just happen to all be, you know, have that connection. And yet when you walk in, each artist is completely different than all the other artists. So it's, it's just washing over you. And, and you and I talked about this. I had I had been listening to a conversation by three Chicanx curators talking about the Chicanx imagination. And as they're talking about these themes of identity and stifling categories and really broad, generous, beautiful ways of connecting across the diaspora, I thought, oh my gosh, is, is this, am I experiencing the Indian identity, the imagination? And Yes. Yeah, I think that, you know, as I mentioned with the historical material, like at the, at the PVD Essex, that's a lot about outsiders looking at India. I mean, though a lot of the work was produced by Indian artists, it's about how the West perceived India. That's not necessarily like how, how we perceive ourselves. Like, I'm not aware of my Indianness all the time. It's when someone says something like, when did you move to this country? Or like, you know, which, which I never, I, I just say I didn't is my answer. Um, but it's only when someone reminds me of my Indianness, because I experience my Indian identity, yes, in part through textiles and, and like, I mean, I specialize in Indian art. Like, it, it is a part of my identity. But Indianness to me looks like the, the capacity to hold multiplicity, the capacity to stand in the chaos um, of, of like a place in, in India and, and to just be able to hold all of it. That is where I feel proud of my, of my identity. It's not so much like the flag or the religions or things like that. 
So, so, so identities are complicated. And you mentioned something that, you know, we had had discussions here at the museum a couple of years ago, deep discussions about Afrofuturism. And you said there's a form of Indian, uh, yeah. what would you call that? What, is, what does that look like? I don't really know what to call it because I don't think we can call it Indian Futurism because um, I've seen it also with Pakistani and Bangladeshi artists. I think that it's uh, South Asian Futurism is also maybe more like it. But then the thing is, is I think it's even bigger than that not to take away from Afrofuturism as its own thing, but I think we have, um, when you have communities um, of people who have experienced things like systemic racism or oppression over hundreds of years, it makes sense to me that artists at a certain point would visualize an alternative reality, an alternate reality where they are the ones in charge, where they are the ones who are maybe traveling the way that like Europeans would use ships to dock in India or in South America and then take over lands. Now we are occupying spaceships and traveling into planets. So that threat that we might ourselves be colonizing powers is a fantasy. It's kind of like working through the trauma by embodying the role of the one who, who like um, inflicted trauma, but also um, it's not just that they might colonize, it's that they are travelers moving through indiscernible space and time. And I think like I have traveled so much in part because my parents are from India. Kanishka's painting of an airport. Right. I cannot tell you how we would stop on the way to India from Chicago and it was eight hours in the Frankfurt airport every single time we went and eight hours back. Some of my earliest memories are of walking through airports. And when you have an identity that cannot, I cannot pass as American very well, and I don't pass as Indian, I myself and so many others are kind of floating through space, incapable of properly landing anywhere. And so I think that there is this futuristic vision where attachment to place is maybe no longer um, relevant, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I, I, I like that you personalize that too. And the airports, yeah, I mean, I got that, but now I really get that, yeah. Yes. And, and I have a friend. Uh, I like miss airports right now. <laughs> no, that's right. No, you can take a fun trip, just, yeah, you don't really go anywhere. Um, so you and I were talking, and I think this is difficult. One of the things about this exhibition is I think people feel daunted. And you actually put it really well, the, the mystery of India. I felt kind of terrible about that, in part just because that was not a part of my school education. It just didn't make it there. I mean, we didn't even get to World War II. Forget about it. Forget about it, you know. Yeah. But but I think that people are daunted by contemporary art in general. Um, so coming into a, a layered experience of contemporary art, I just say, just throw caution in the wind and let's just all experience it and let it wash over us and, and you know, read the labels. But even just the terms that you use, modern and contemporary, confuse confuse scholars of modern and contemporary art. Forget about early modern. There are so many different definitions, right? And I was saying to you the other day, like the more time that goes on, we need a new word for contemporary or something because, so how would you, how, how do you define that in terms of? Industry? It is so problematic. I mean, one of the, one of the like major texts on Indian modern art it's a text or an essay in my moment. I'm having like a brain fart right now. <laughs> when was modernism? When was modernism? Like, when does it's like a, a switch flip and now it's modern? You know, like this is so problematic. So to me, like photography is considered a more modern, uh, you know, technology, I would say. But photography arrived in India, like the year or the year meant because the British, British were there. And so, but Indian photography is not considered modern Indian art. So the way that, like 19th century Indian photography is not modern Indian art, even though photography itself is like modern. So modern Indian art tends to be loosely partitioned, though you could say 1920s and 1930s was modern. Some people would go to like 1900. And, and, and it tends to extend into like the 90s. 80s, 90s, and then you have artists who are crossing over, like Atul Dodia, Anju Dodia's husband. We have work by him, and at that time, all of this was considered contemporary art. Um, 
So Hussein was like a contemporary artist in his time. And now he's like a modern artist. Well, I mean, he's dead, which is, I mean, part of it. But like, these are very, very problematic words. Um, so contemporary, you know, loosely being about now. And modern tends to be partitioned in the decades after, slightly before and after. Um, I'll say that we have a clever way of dealing with that at, at the PV Essex, which is that um, we have a curator of the present tense, Trevor Smith. And he's a curator of the present tense. And you think of that, and it's about nowness, the present. And there will be multiple present moments. Um, but the work reflects on, on, on now. Wait, I should know this. Are you saying that's, that's actually the title? Yeah, he's the curator of the present tense. That is wild. Yeah, wow. that's great. <laughs> wow. Well, I got a, I got a question. Um, and actually, I, I love this question. You know, we were bantering. You know, my work on the <laughs> Revolution was about artists who recycled things from the imperial era, era and then reused them as revolutionaries. And so this question I love. Um, she says, I was fascinated by the various kinds of salvage, repurposing, recycling, remixing in the show. This is a global trend, I think, but is there a particularly Indian aspect to be discussed? Mm. And I think that comes up a lot. There are two works by Shetty that reuse wood, for example, from buildings, but... Um, mm. That is a great um, question that I don't know how to answer because I don't know how to take the recycling of objects, or let's say working with found objects, and then seeing what of that process is distinctly Indian and not. Because I think it's part of like the, um, part of the artistic process. Like, like I know during lockdown, I've, I've talked to a number of artists during lockdown where they could not access their studios, they could not access their materials. So then you work with what you've got, um, and you've got, you know, a notebook and a pen and someone who's a painter is now suddenly drawing or doing like collage and things and so i think there's some aspect of it of like working with what you have i also know like in baroda my family is from baroda in india which was a major center for for art study um one of the great teachers there kg the late kg subramanian um had a process of making toys out of like carpet wood just like putting things together almost like like picasso's like bullheads out of a bicycle seat and and um handles so i do think that this is part of like a a universal artistic process um but one thing i will add though is that this relates to the idea of craft and art again words that just screw us up and trip us up all the time what is craft <laughs> like when like what is craft and what is art and then what is arts and crafts <laughs> because you can have a textile artist and i wouldn't say they're a crafts person um and so i think by reclaiming techniques that are traditionally indian let's say like embroidery um is also perhaps a way of reclaiming power for what was relegated to craft and like craftsman's work and elevating it to high art because in India, like Western art, I would say, traditionally like painting, sculpture, architecture. If we're talking about India or the subcontinent, I think it's textiles, sculpture and architecture are together, and jewelry. Like to me, those are the postcards of the subcontinent. Jewels, textiles, um, and then maybe like art. I mean, it could be anything else, but I think jewelry and textiles is definitely high art. Yeah, I love that you said that, and it reminds me of conversations I've had uh, this year with Rena Banerjee and how she really talks about being in a very sort of here are the Western hierarchies grad school, and she just came in and spread everything across the table. It's like, no, I work this way. Like, I work broadly, and it's everything, and and just like from everywhere, and and she loved. And that messiness, and I say messiness as a positive, that is like a brand, you know, even her titles are so long, yes. like how many words, you know, and I love that, that um, it's like a foil to that sort of rigidity of exactly. and craft included, yeah. So this is actually like, and we'll get to the question, we'll get back to the questions, but like my, my PhD dissertation was on ornament because there is this idea that ornamentation, like busyness or messiness, or like patterns is superficial. Like it's the decoration you put on top of something when it's done. 
But in our context, ornament is essential. It is the completion of something. It is part and parcel integral to that which is being ornamented. So I love that artists like Rina or like the Kanishka painting that we saw earlier, the patterns and everything, you know, it looks just like messy and busy, but there's deep symbolic meaning in the particular patterns that Kanishka is using in that work, <laughs> you know? So this is also reclaiming power, I think. Right, and, and we discuss that a bit. Yeah. Um, so uh, Susan, who asked the question about recycling, reminded me too that Nab and Thomas, you know, going to scrapyards and finding those images, um, recycling images really from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, kind of like post partition and pre what he calls future Silicon Valley. It was a great yeah. sort of nostalgic moment. Um, but there was a question related to the wood is wood a scarcity in present day India? Do you know that? Um, I imagine it is in like in a lot of places. Certainly deforestation continues. Um, there was definitely, you know, this unfortunate idea that like when Hindus will traditionally cremate bodies when someone dies. And the pyre, there was like a sign of respect to add sandalwood um into the pyre. Because it's like it's like, you know, it's fragrant and it's holy, and there's all of these like positive, auspicious associations with it. But that was leading to mass deforestation of sandalwood, you know, you know, of the trees. And so that, I believe, was outlawed, um, that you can no longer use sandalwood um, for those things. So, yes, deforestation. And as cities continue to sprawl, certainly, like in the section on building a nation at the, at the, the museum here, we look at the desire to pursue success, but also how, like, humans' desire for success also has environmental ramifications in India. So we look at that conflict between um, a desire for success and how the built environment attacks the natural environment. Yeah, also, I mean, it's so this is really random, but when you said that, you know, the way one thing affects another thing is so interesting. I, I, I really like fashion history a lot. And I remember, you know, when men and women stopped wearing hats in the 60s, it decimated towns in the Northeast yeah. because they were milk. They were millinery towns. They made things and gloves too. Whole towns are based on gloves, and so one thing just changes everything, and and that has also environmental and economic yes. uh, ramifications. It's just interesting. Um, but I wanted to go back and talk to you. I'm so interested. I wish I could click my heels and just go see your new galleries. But tell us more about the collectors and how the museum acquired um, the collections you work with. Yeah. Thanks for asking. It's 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 kind of a lovely story. Um, the couple were Chester and Davida Hurwitz of Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, we we'll just take a moment to love those names for a second. Yes, I know, they're great, right? Chet, Chet and Davy. <laughs> Chet and Davy, so sweet. Um, and they, she had a handbag company called Davy's Handbags. And they had gone to India once in 1962. Um, they would travel around, like sourcing leather and textiles for these handbags and wallets and things. And um, in 1973, they went to a gallery in Paris where they saw Hussein's Mahabharata paintings that I mentioned, one of which um, I showed at the end. They fell in love with them and they bought 11. Um, that was their, their, that started a passion for modern Indian art. And they decided that they were going to go back to India after buying this work and they wanted to meet Hussein. So they did. He became their really good friend traveled the country with them. They would go annually for nearly 30 years and were meeting artists across the entire country, buying work, um, ultimately amassing between four and 5,000 works um, by the leading artists of India and many younger ones too. And up in tension, was to then give these paintings to India, for them to be in a museum in India. But Hussein was a controversial figure later in his life. And in the 90s, when his, um, he was being attacked in India, they, they made a commitment not to take the art. They didn't feel it would be safe in India. And they ended up giving it to us. Um, and part of that reason was, this was a moment when very few people were buying modern slash and or contemporary Indian art, including in India. There were not that many collectors. There were very few galleries. Um, our director at the time decided to take a risk and do this. 
Now, interesting to note is the very now modern or contemporary Indian art is quite a global thing. People really like know the names of these artists, but the very first auctions at Sotheby's in 1995 were from the Hurwitz collection. So it was these collectors who really got the wheels turning. So we got that gift in around 2000 and it established us as like the first museum to have a permanent gallery devoted to this kind of work. I have a question here and I'm not sure what the, do you know anything about Peter Hurwitz's parents? I think, okay. Yeah, I think, I think that's Chester and Davey. I mean, they're, oh, they're with oh, Tom. I see. I, see. I think. Just, this is for my friend who knows everyone, literally. Uh, okay. So, okay. Oh, <laughs> she probably knows. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, think, I, think that's right. <laughs> yes. I think we're talking about the same people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, what else, what else should we, what else do you want to talk about in particular? Or we still have a few minutes left. Well, I want to say, um, I want to, you know, I use the word mystify or demystify. Um, I want to kind of help people by saying that contemporary Indian art is challenging for me. And I am steeped in the culture. I have worked professionally with this kind of material for now over 20 years. Um, I don't know it all. I don't get it all. And while there might be references to historical moments that people don't know about or um, figures that nobody has ever heard of before, that's actually not the point. These works can be experienced by anybody and that that experience is actually where the work needs to happen. So when you see Sudeshan Shetty's like dogs with the cameras, I mean, that I, I've never seen that in real life and I really wish I could. I, I, I can look at that and feel like, I don't know, I don't, let's say I'm, I've never been to India. I don't know, what, I don't understand this because I don't know India. It, it doesn't have to do with that. Like, like having the Indian experience is not going to necessarily help someone. It's all about just the experience of being somewhere in between, of knowing and not knowing, of recognizing something but not knowing what to do with it, that is what so much of this work does. And so I really commend your museum for, for doing this show because um, what a challenging place to, to ask the visitors to be and what an opportunity for people to tap into feelings and see things they would never even think of. Um, I totally agree, and I'm having. So, I'm just so, I'm so thrilled about just being in those spaces because the scale, the scale. I keep talking about the ambitious scale of everything too. You can feel the ambition of the artist. But what's so great about uh, Shetty's dogs, which you know, there's a camera in each of the nine dogs, and they're watching you, and then you are on the cameras behind it. But it's facing off of Barty Kerr's uh, Bindi pieces, which are the third eye, which are also watching you. So I feel like when you're walking between those paintings and the dogs, you're being zapped by, by both works that have a life, like a life force to them in, in some imaginary place. That I've so I'm, I'm so fascinated. I really wish I could see that show because I wish I could be there to do this talk because the thing is, is there's a very, there's a great quote that I love by a, um, I think she's now retired, a professor at Harvard, Diana Eck, where she said, in India, seeing is a kind of touching. And if you've ever been to India, I mean, I know, like, I, I, I've i seen the way that Indians will often look at, like, non-Indian people, like, well, but the thing is, is, even as an Indian person, there is this ability to take in so much information with the eyes. Looking and staring is not considered, um, it's not like rude in that in our culture. It's just people will just stare. And so the sense of being looked at and the discomfort of feeling looked at, what you've done in that gallery is actually recreated a moment of discomfort that one actually might experience in India, which is a sense of being stared at. Uh, that's fascinating, and I also want to write down what you said because I think that's our new no touching label. <laughs> <laughs> See, seeing is a kind of touching. <laughs> seeing is a kind of touching. Just leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I guess we should probably wrap it up. This has been so lovely, and and you've just sort of opened. I think I think all of us are um, 
it's so funny that we're in sort of a closed moment in the world right now, but this exhibition is opening us up in a really interesting way, like opening our minds. And um, so thank you. Thank you for taking us back and showing us what came up to this. And uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you for, 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 for doing this exhibition. Um, it's really, it's important. You're doing the good work by showing the work of these artists. Um, it's important. And, and I, I really am grateful to you for doing this. And I appreciate I, you saying that and the generosity of, of the Pizzuti collection and Ron and Anne for yeah. lending it for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you. Oh, okay. Love, love, love. <laughs> Leaving the meeting. <laughs>